Okay, so I think we can get started. There's there's a, a lot more people in here than, than it looks like because the, I've got two rows of people on my particular screen. Um, so there's lots of people joining us, which is great. Um, I, there was no point in my wearing special shoes because you can't see my feet, but I did uh, wear my festive red lipstick, uh, which I have not worn in almost two years because uh, what's the point in wearing this under a mask? But uh, I hope you understand that I, I put this on just for you. Amen. So, <laughs> just like Taylor Swift. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to ask everybody to mute their their screens, uh, unless they have a question. Um, but you can also use the the raise hand function if you can find it. It's different on on everybody's uh, device if you want to ask a question. Um, and this has a slightly different structure. It's a bit more like the first week in the sense that that there's um, me talking a bunch of times and also showing you things. Um, we're going to have clips today, uh, special clips uh, of, of different um, versions of A Christmas Carol. Uh, so it's really good to, for everybody to mute for that or else you won't be able to hear the clip. But we've tested the sound, so we should be good to go. Uh, and then we'll have uh, time for discussion at the end. All right? Sounds, Sounds good. good. Yes? Yeah. Good. All right. Everybody mute, except for me, obviously. And, uh, and we'll get started. So welcome everyone to our Advent study. This is week four. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. So first of all, I saw this tweet last year and I went hunting for it so that uh, all of you could see it tonight. And for anyone who's having trouble reading it, it says, I feel like this holiday season, it's important to remember the, remind people of the true meaning of Christmas. Ghosts terrorizing rich people in the middle of the night until they agree to pay their employees more. Which, you know, is an interesting interpretation of the story, uh, but there are a lot of, of different uh, interpretations of the story. Uh, and there's a lot of jokes uh, online this time of year when, whenever uh, we, we roll around to Christmas, lots of Christmas carol themed jokes. And um, a lot of them, most of them, I would say, uh, are are playing on the theme of the three spirits and, and the past, the present and the future. Uh, and it, it would seem to me all of them are focusing on that pre-redemption Scrooge. You know, the way that we've been, we've been talking about that people don't remember redeemed Scrooge. They remember old crabby miserly Scrooge because that's way more fun to, to play with in, in their different kinds of, of ways. Um, and there's also all the advertisements and commercials. Uh, many, if not all of you, will remember this. Thanks to Canadian Tire, everyone's in the spirit of Christmas. Not quite everyone. But Ebenezer, think of all the money you'll save at Canadian Tire. Mm. Get the 10-pack of Bic razors for only $1.33, or Bic lighters for just 77 cents each. And this reusable hot-touch portable heating pad is only 89 cents. So I can save that much? Come on, give it a try. Fa -la 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 -la. La -la -la. Canadian Tire lets you give like Santa and save like Scrooge. Does everybody remember that that commercial? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I remember it too. I, I, I think I remember that particular one, which is from, I, I think, 1984 or 85, right quite early in the ad campaign. Uh, and you may remember too that, that eventually they stopped having Santa at all and it was just Scrooge uh, being delighted about saving lots of money. So he could be generous, but also save money at the same time, which wasn't quite the point uh, of the original story. Um, but there's also a, a commercial that, that Archdeacon Sally, you, you sent to me uh, a few weeks ago when we were planning for, for this Advent study, and this commercial is from this year. Thanks to Canadian Times. There we go. Ebenezer. Ebenezer. <laughs> really? First, you will see the past. <laughs> And then the present. And finally, Ebenezer, the future. <laughs> Good 
Introducing the all-electric EQS. Happy holidays from Mercedes-Benz. When, uh, when Archie and Sally sent me that, I, I said to her, I think they've rather lost the plot. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> they, they've sort of vaguely taken the theme of past, present, and future and used it to sell an electric car, which I'm all for electric cars, but it's a little bit of an odd choice. Hmm. Yet the idea of uh, learning something from the past, the present, and the future has been used a lot to make a point, like just like I did in my sermon for last Sunday. Although sometimes, you know, as, as we say, it's, it's not quite learning something from the past, the present, and the future, or, or instead it's judging it, uh, as in, in the commercial. Um, when, when academics analyze a piece of writing, they often talk about the author's intent and will examine the way that it was perceived or received at the time when it was written. And the same thing can happen when analyzing a film or a television program. What did the writer or the director intend when they created it? What did the actors mean to do? Uh, how did audiences feel about it at the time? And how do we feel about it now? And all of those things can be completely different even when talking about the same thing. For the first week of the Advent study, I made a point of giving you the historical and social context, right? And this week, we're going to be looking at some adaptations of A Christmas Carol, and I'll be doing the same thing with these, those adaptations. And we'll try our best to, to think about how we respond to it now, but also how they may have responded to it at the time. People were avid readers. They were avid readers of this story in particular. Um, in, in the, in the uh, interest of full disclosure, uh, this young woman uh, in the photograph is actually from a, a couple of years after the publication of, of A Christmas Carol's 1847, if I remember correctly, instead of 1843. Uh, but but you can see, you know, how, how very important it is to her to be photographed with a book, because obviously this is something that interests her reading. So what makes a good adaptation? That is a subject which most people can't agree upon. For some people, a good adaptation is one which is extremely faithful to the source material, the original story. For others, a good adaptation is one which feels like the original story. We all feel things when we read something. We have, we have emotions, we're happy, we're sad, we're engrossed in it. And we kind of want to feel the same way when we see it adapted for film or television. And then there are still others who think that doing something completely different, reinterpreting something uh, and, and making it more topical in their adaptation is the way to go. We all have a favorite adaptation of A Christmas Carol, don't we? But why do we love it? Is it because it was true to the book? Because it was well done? Because we have nostalgia for it? or some combination of all of those things. You would not believe the sheer number of A Christmas Carol best of lists, lists I have encountered when doing research for this study. But I've always, um, I've always thought that when a person talks about the best anything, it's just a grown up way of saying my favorite. A child isn't afraid of naming their favorite anything, right? When you ask a kid, what's your favorite dinosaur? They're, they're happy to answer. By the way, my, mine is Diplodocus. Diplodocus is my favorite dinosaur. So tonight, I won't be telling you any of these adaptations are the best. Instead, these are some of my favorite ways that parts of A Christmas Carol were adapted for the big or small screen. So I present my totally biased, not chronological list of excellent Christmas Carol moments. There have been adaptations of A Christmas Carol from almost the very beginning. There was, as I mentioned in week one, Charles Dickens' own dramatic readings of it, and he adapted it according to his audience. There, was also there are also stage versions starting in the 19th century and beyond. And when movies were invented, there were soon film versions of it as well. This is an image from a film from 1913 called Old Scrooge. 
Uh, it is on YouTube if you want to check it out, uh, though it doesn't contain my favorite anything. Um, it's very, it very much looks like a staged, stylized adaptation. Um, films in 1913, they were capable of really remarkable special effects, but this one isn't particularly stunning in it. And yes, that is uh, Mar the ghost of Jacob Marley dressed in a bedsheet. So perhaps it's not the most effective uh, depiction of a ghost. But it is interesting to look at. And I can see what they wanted to portray. When stage film and television actor Patrick Stewart was still starring in Star Trek Next Generation as Captain Picard, the best captain, of course, he found himself missing the stage, but unable to return to his native England for long enough to do shows with the Royal Shakespeare Company or the National Theatre, things that he had done in his pre-Star Trek career. So he began doing a lot of one-man productions in California where Star Trek The Next Generation was being filmed. One of those one-man shows was an adaptation of A Christmas Carol, one-man show, in which he played all the parts from Scrooge down to Tiny Tim. Mm. And his performances were praised by critics who compared them to Dickens' own dramatic readings a century before. And then in 1999, a few years after Star Trek The Next Generation ended, he starred in a television adaptation which also featured Richard E. Grant as Bob Cratchit, Joel Grey as The Ghost of Christmas Past, and Laura Fraser as Belle, his long-lost fiance. Remember how the story begins? Hmm? Marley was dead to begin with. The story begins with death because Dickens wants to point out the miraculous nature of the events he is about to relate. And also because by starting with death, death so utterly profound that there's seemingly nowhere to go from there, Dickens makes the joy of the ending all the greater in contrast. But the story still starts with Jacob Marley dead as a doornail. Most adaptations of the story start with Scrooge in his office seven years after Marley's death, but the 1999 version starts like this. So there you see a really brilliant way of adapting those opening paragraphs, right? That, that little, it, it's all narr narrative in there, it's a narration, right? It's, it's Dickens speaking to us about how dead Marley is and about Scrooge and his character but they very um, elegantly transfer that into film language by portraying the funeral and, and having us see Scrooge mourning his partner, but in a very cold way, in a very cold vestry. Uh, I don't know if you can see the, the clouds of, of breath coming out of their mouths when they're talking. This is, you know, this is someone who brings cold with him and he's in a cold environment. And then what happens next in the, in the show is that it moves on to, the time of, of the story, the main part of the story, seven years later in that frigid office with that increasingly frigid Scrooge. There's something about the way that, that in film language you can, you know, encapsulate uh, several paragraphs of writing into very effective images. Hmm? Following the success of the musical Oliver, which was, of course, the filmed version of the stage play, there was a musical adaptation of A Christmas Carol in 1970 called Scrooge and starring Albert Finney in the title role with Alec Guinness as Jacob Marley. Uh, this is a picture of Albert Finney uh, and he is at this point singing his opening song, which is entitled I Hate People, which pretty much sums it up. <laughs> Reception to the musical Scrooge was a bit mixed, but Albert Finney won the Golden Globe for Best Actor in a Comedy or Musical that year. And then because he was only 34 at the time of playing this part, he could play both old Scrooge in the present day and young Scrooge in the scenes with the ghost of Christmas past. Some critics found the music uh, unmemorable, um, but one song in the film uh, was nominated for an Oscar for Best Song, although it didn't win. And it is featured in the clip I'm about to show, which is my favorite depiction of the way in which all the people who owe Scrooge money react when they learn of his death. 
Scrooge arriving a little late on the scene doesn't quite realize the source of their jubilation. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all the people who have assembled here, I would merely like to mention, if I may, that our unanimous attitude is one of lasting gratitude for what our friend has done for us today. <laughs> and therefore, I would simply like to say... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's the nicest thing that anyone's ever done for me. I may sound up for Dutch, but my delight is such. I feel as if a losing war's been won for me. And if I had a flag, I'd hang me flag out to add a sort of final victory touch. But since I left me flag alone, I'll simply have to say thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that's the nicest thing that anyone's ever done for me. It sounds a bit bizarre, but things the way they are. I feel as if another life's begun for me. And if I had a cannon, I would fire it. To add a sort of celebration The sound got a little unsynced there, but I think you get the gist. Uh, and yes, uh, they were dancing on Scrooge's coffin, which is a little bit dark, but then so is my sense of humor. So I happen to find it rather funny. Also, uh, that song is very catchy. It's now going to be in your heads all night. You're welcome. In adaptations of A Christmas Carol, there's always been a, a difficulty in portraying the ghosts. I've never quite seen a Marley who fully conveyed the weight of his chains, although many of them have been just as frightening to me uh, as they were to Scrooge. Certainly as a child, I was absolutely terrified of every version of Jacob Marley. Uh, I once heard a story about a, a modern stage adaptation, uh, which like the 1999 version began with Marley's funeral. So the minister is reading the burial service in front of the coffin. He's reading earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And at the same time, you can hear Marley's voice saying, Scrooge, Scrooge. And at the conclusion of the scene, he bursts out of his coffin, points to Scrooge and says, repent before it's too late. And then the lights went out in the theater and everyone screamed. <laughs> and I think if, if uh, I, I had been in that theater that night, I'd still be running. The Ghost of Christmas Past is a, is a particular problem too, because Dickens' description is very strange and otherworldly. And a lot of films pick a concept and go with it. Uh, when, the, when the ghost isn't being portrayed by a well-known figure like Jiminy Cricket there, as you can see. Um, for example, the, the center figure, the lady wearing red, uh, that's Dame Edith N. Evans playing the ghost of Christmas past in the musical Scrooge, the version that we just saw the scene from. Not at all what Dickens described, but works very well in the context of the story. The Ghost of Christmas Present uh, has a really detailed description in the text, and most adaptations don't deviate from it. The idea of a vaguely religious, vaguely pagan Father Christmas sort of figure works very well, after all. And the Ghosts of Christmas Future, well, representations of, of that tend not to deviate from Dickens' description either. But some versions are more uh, effective than others, I think, which leads me to the 1984 adaptation starring George C. Scott as Scrooge. It was aired in America uh, on television, but it was released in cinemas in Britain, and it has been praised as an extremely faithful adaptation to the original story. 
It also has my favorite version of the ghost of Christmas future. of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Am I not? You're about to show me the shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so? Speak to me. Very well. Lead on. The night is waning fast. Time is precious to me. Sometimes the most effective thing to do is to stand still. This particular version doesn't move very much. But between the costuming and the fact that there appears to be a slight draft so that the drapings move a little bit right you really do get why this is the ghost that scrooge fears most of all i call this next part of our session the case for the muppet christmas carol the muppet christmas carol came out in december of 1992. it was the first muppet film made after the death of the creator Jim Henson from bacterial pneumonia and the Muppeteer Richard Hunt in early 1992 from AIDS. The film was directed by then 29 year old Brian Henson, Jim Henson's son. It was his directorial debut, his first film. Brian Henson asked Paul Williams to write the songs with composer Miles Goodman. Williams worked with the Muppets in 1979 for the Muppet movie. He wrote The Rainbow Connection, which is a lot of people's favorite Muppet song. Williams had um, struggled with addiction in the previous decade, and he had only recently sought treatment and become sober. He was somewhat surprised to be asked to write songs for the film, but Brian Henson said, I want you. And there really isn't a better choice than a recovered addict to write songs for a story about transformation and redemption, is there? This was Paul Williams' life experience, and it shows. Henson wanted a British actor to play Scrooge and eventually settled on Michael Caine, who was delighted to join the film. He said to Henson, I'm going to play this movie like I'm working with the Royal Shakespeare Company. I will never wink. I will never do anything Muppety. I am going to play Scrooge as if it is an utterly dramatic role and there are no puppets around me. And Henson replied, yes, bang on. As uh, a lot of the human co-stars of the Muppets discover, the best thing to do is to pretend that you are in a totally normal environment and that it's fine that you're speaking to a talking frog or pig or bear. Kane's performance is uh, truly special, I think. Every Scrooge has to decide how to play the progression from solitary oyster to compassionate human being. And Kane does a masterful job. He absolutely treats every Muppet with the same courtesy as he does any human co-star. He continues to the present day to name this as one of his favorite roles ever. And this is a man who has worked with countless film, film and theater legends and won two Oscars. The casting of the Muppet roles is no less brilliant. Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy make an excellent Mr. and Mrs. Cratchit. Statler and Waldorf, those two hecklers from the balcony, they become the Marleys. In this case, there are two of them. 
Fozzie Bear is Scrooge's old employer, Mr. Fozziewig. He was cast simply for the sake of being able to make the pun from Fezziwig to Fozziewig. Bunsen and Beaker play the two gentlemen looking for a donation at the beginning of the story. And in a brilliant choice, they decided to make Charles Dickens himself a character and have him played by Gonzo the Great with Rizzo the Rat as his sidekick and, and a kind of audience surrogate to comment on the action and ask questions. They cast Gonzo apparently because it seemed like the most unlikely choice of Muppet to play Charles Dickens, but it really works. And I don't just say that because I have a particular fondness for Gonzo. It also means that they can quote both in his narration and in the dialogue, huge swaths of Dickens' original text. In fact, it is one of the most faithful adaptations in that way, in spite of all those pigs and bears and frogs. At this point, I would like to point out the costumes, which look great, of course, but as an historian, just allow me this nerdy moment because I'm so deeply impressed when I watch this film because the costumes are historically accurate, even the ones on the Muppets. Look at Gonzo, excuse me, Charles Dickens. He's got little buttoned boots, checked trousers. He's wearing a double waistcoat, two different waistcoats, which was all the rage in 1843. His frock coat, his top hat, beautiful work. In the opening scene, when Gonzo and Rizzo are standing beside an apple cart, Rizzo is wearing a particular type of shirt known as a Carter smock. Someone, I don't know who, spent countless hours hand smocking a shirt worn by a rat puppet for five minutes. And why did they do this? For the love of the thing. I guess that's why I'm here making a case for the Muppet Christmas Carol. There, there's so much love in it. Love for the people that they lost, love for the family and friends and colleagues that they still had around them, love for the source material, love for what they do and how they do it, so much so that they are all striving to make the best film possible, even if it's just a kid's film. They feel that everyone deserves that attention to detail and that quality. In week one, I talked a little bit about the problem of sentiment and of the character of Tiny Tim. He's almost become this stereotype and many people find him saccharine at best and infuriating at worst, which is not at all what Dickens intended and probably not necessarily what the people who read the original story felt when reading it. Which leads me to the clips I want to show you. There are three in a row. I think there are many ways uh, and things that I could have shown you about A Muppet Christmas Carol, but it also contains my very favorite Tiny Tim, portrayed by Robin the Frog. So, first of all, this is how he's introduced. I'd like to add that that was accomplished entirely as a practical effect the movement of the legs and the ground underneath them. Very clever. The second clip is from the Christmas dinner itself. Scrooge makes with the ghost of Christmas yet to come. They did something very smart by casting dear little Robin as Tiny Tim, a character that we already love, right? And the idea that he might die is absolutely devastating. And so you get that original impact of what it would be like to think about that child dying and how Scrooge feels about it, right? It's devastating to his family. It's devastating to Scrooge. It's devastating to us. And when Bob Cratchit gives that speech to his remaining family, I'm sure we shall none of us forget poor tiny Tim or this first parting that was among us. That is directly from the original story. Bob Cratchit in the film says it to his family. But Kermit, who was originally voiced and performed by Jim Henson, is also saying it to all of us. It's what they call very meta. I love this adaptation, not because I saw it as a child. It came out when I was a teenager and I didn't see it in the theater. I was well, well, well into adulthood before I finally saw it. But there is so much 
sincerity and love in it that I can't recommend it enough. But I'm sure all of you are wondering where the heck is Alistair Sim? Don't worry, we've arrived there at last. Scrooge, known as a Christmas Carol in the US, was released in 1951. And it did well in Britain, but not so well in the US, at least until it started to be shown on television every year at Christmas time. It's rather like It's a Wonderful Life in that regard, which also had some critical praise, but didn't do so well at the box office until it started running regularly on television. This is another excellent adaptation. And I think I'm not having to, to convert all of you to this idea, since it's the one that you've all mentioned the most in these last few weeks. It does take some liberties. Uh, this is the version that we get some of these extra plot points that we're all, we're all remembering. Specifically, that Scrooge's mother died in childbirth having him, and this is why his father hates him. Whereas in the story, her cause of death is not mentioned, and his sister Fan is his younger sister, much younger, in fact. And so obviously their mother did not die giving birth to him. The original story states that Fan is also dead, but says nothing about her dying in childbirth having his nephew Fred either. The subplot of the corrupt Mr. Jorkin, who lures Scrooge away from Mr. Fezziwig and introduces him to Jacob Marley in the first place is a complete invention for the film. We know absolutely nothing about what happened in Scrooge's life between his working under Fezziwig and his being the sole remaining member of Scrooge and Marley. Finally, the film renames Scrooge's fiance Belle Alice and makes her some kind of spinster working with the poor instead of a happily married mother of several children that we see in the story. In the story, Dickens seems to be making a, a point of the road, less, the road less traveled, right? Scrooge is looking at this and thinking this could have been his life if he had chosen another path. By the standards of a person who considers a good adaptation to be a faithful one, this might not quite cut the mustard, but I have a deep fondness for it and a love of Alistair Sims' portrayal of Scrooge. He it was uh, what's called a character actor. So this is the exact sort of part that's made for someone like him. I said before that anyone who plays Scrooge needs to make certain acting choices about how to portray Scrooge's transformation. And many do it very well, like Michael Caine, as I just said, and Patrick Stewart as well. But I think my favorite portrayal of Scrooge's Christmas morning joy is the Alistair Sim version. Sorry, not quite synchronized. Let me try this again. I apologize, this is slightly off. We're just gonna try and deal with it. I didn't have a chance to test it beforehand. Tell me, what day is it? What day? Well, it's Christmas Day, of course. Christmas Day, Christmas Day. Then I haven't missed it. <laughs> the spirits must have done everything in one night. Of course, they can do anything, can't they? Of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Are you quite yourself, sir? What? I don't know. No, I, I don't think so. I hope not. What? <laughs> the curtains are still here. They're still here. You didn't you didn't tear them down and sell them. Huh? They're, they're here now. Everything's here. I'm here. <laughs> and the shadows of things that would be can still be dispelled. And they will be. I know they will be. I know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm as light as a feather. <laughs> I'm as happy as a, I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. <laughs> I'm as giddy. I'm as giddy as a drunken man. I, I never. <laughs> a merry Christmas, Ebenezer. <laughs> you old humbug. <laughs> and a happy new year, <laughs> as if you deserved it. <laughs> oh, merry, merry Christmas, Mrs. Dilber. Thank you, you sir. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and many, many of them. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Mr. Dilber, there's the corner where the spirit of Christmas present sat. And there's the door where Jacob Marley's ghost came through. And there's the window where I saw the wandering spirit. It's right, it's true, it all happened to I? I don't know what day of the month it is. I, I don't know how long I've been amongst the spirits. I, I don't know anything. I never did know anything. <laughs> but now I know that I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know anything. I never did know anything. But now I know that I don't know all of the Christmas morning. I must stand in my head. I must stand in my head. <laughs> please, please, Mr. Dilber. I am not mad. Even if I look <laughs> Don't be violent, Mr. Scrooge, sir. You forced me to scream for the beetle. The beetle, madam. <laughs> A thing for the beetle. A guinea? Here, what for? I'll give you one guess. To keep me mouth shut. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Miss Dilber. It's for a Christmas present. A Christmas present? For me? Of course, for you. <laughs> a merry, merry Christmas. Dear Mrs. Dilber, <laughs> oh, how much do I pay you? Two shillings a week. What? Two shillings? It's forthwith raised to ten. Ten shillings a week here. You're sure you don't want to see a doctor? A doctor? Certainly not. Nor the undertaker. <laughs> now off you go and enjoy yourself. Like a good girl. Bob's your uncle! <laughs> Merry Christmas, Mr. Scrooge! In keeping with the situation! I'm not the... Sorry about the sound. I should have tested it beforehand, but I didn't have a chance. But uh, I think we're all pretty familiar with this, aren't we? We're familiar with this version? I think so. So I, I'm very, very fond of the, the post-Redemption Scrooge in this version. The story isn't about scaring a rich man straight, like that tweet says. It's about transforming him so that he recognizes the value of others and of himself. And it's all there in Sim's portrayal. And that's something we haven't discussed as much of in the last few weeks, the theme of joy. Scrooge's joy at finding that he still has the rest of his life to make connections and to make amends. And finding that he has so much ahead of him. If an actor can nail that, I think we have ourselves a successful adaptation of Christmas Carol. Here's Patrick Stewart's portrayal, and here he is welcoming the Cratchits into his home. Here's an image from the end of the musical Scrooge. You remember that he opened by singing, I hate people, but the closing number is, I like life. And, he, and many of the people here are the people that were dancing on his coffin, including that chap directly to his right, uh, who are now transformed as well by his sudden 
warmth and benevolence. Here's Michael Caine surrounded by the Muppets, wearing a bright red scarf, which is given to him in the film in a scene which never fails to make me cry. And the story is still being adapted on stage too. There's a current production in California starring Bradley Whitford, best known for his portrayal of Josh Lyman in The West Wing, whose performance is being praised for, and I quote, an erratic, ecstatic exaltation that sparks from him like a live wire and provokes plenty of warm laughter as both he and the audience are in on the sheer audacity and absurdity of this second chance. People have interpreted and will continue to interpret A Christmas Carol from many different perspectives. For us, we can't help but look at it from a Christian perspective. And regardless of Dickens' personal beliefs, and they are a little vague, this story was plainly written in a culturally Christian society. And we recognize that as readers and as viewers. And so Scrooge's joy at his own redemption echoes our own joy at our own salvation in the boundless, ineffable grace of God. My totally biased, not chronological list of excellent Christmas Carol moments, which you have seen tonight, has been based on what I love and admire best about the original story. But now I'm going to ask you what you love best in classic adaptations like A Christmas Carol and in other Christmas time tales like The Grinch Who Stole Christmas or It's a Wonderful Life, who owe themselves to Dickens' tale. Feel free to, to unmute yourself or to do your little raise hand if you want to say. I think there's so Sounds much, I, so much that we that we love in all of it. it it's hard to pick out one thing. Um, I just recently watched The Muppets, thanks to you. And uh, I, I love the Muppets. I mean, it, it made me maybe joyful. I think, I think that's the thing about you really catch the joyful bit. And you have the, such a lovely juxtaposition between Kermit, Bob Cratchit, and, and, and Scrooge. And I think that juxtaposition, we all know where it's going. And, and we wait breathlessly until it happens. So I think I'd have to say it's the, it's the whole, the whole story. The whole package? The whole, the whole package that I, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I know. It's, um, it's one of those films where everything's good in it. You know, you're not sitting there wishing that something was better. And and so it's a it's an excellent it's excellent for children, but it 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 sells pretty well to adults too. I think. I think there was there was one called Scrooged that I only saw a snippet of, and I didn't like it. Uh, it's I it's yeah, Scrooged is is I can't remember, quite remember the date. It was eighty something, and it stars Bill Murray. And I have to tell you, I haven't seen it in so many years, and I didn't have a chance to rewatch it for for the study. I don't remember liking it that much, but I, I was quite young when I watched it. Uh, but if, if anybody has seen it, um, feel free to, to give your, your opinion on it. It's not the newest um, thing in the, in the canon of, of Scrooge movies. There, there are quite a few modern versions. Uh, there's one with Henry Winkler. There's one with Vanessa Williams. I think there's one with Tori Spelling. <laughs> I don't know. Um, there, there's a there's a whole bunch of them where where it's it's a modern adaptation of the story. You know, one thing you you mentioned at the beginning, I'll I'll try not to talk too much, but was the fact that um, uh, there are adaptations, and and it depends on the context, what the producer had in mind to the, get to the point, and I can't help but uh, compare that to the four gospels, which were so much influenced by the situation in which each of those little communities found themselves. And so you find things arranged a little differently in, in the gospels 
and uh, to make a point that, that the community needed to address. And it's, and it's there's a lot of similarity going on here. <laughs> absolutely. You know, we, we, we have, um, you know, gospels that, that seem to be written very much for a non-Jewish audience, gospels that are written for a Jewish audience. Um, there, there's a slight, you know, emphasis, you know, for the Jewish audience, it emphasizes Jesus as the long promised Messiah. For a non-Jewish audience, it emphasizes Jesus as the son of God, right? It, 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 there, there's just these little tweaks and, and, and differences um, that are really interesting. And you see that, you know, something like Scrooge, the Alistair Sim version, um, is, is a post-war British film. Um, you know, they, they, and, and this is this is a Britain that is still recovering from the Second World War. They're still on rationing, wartime rationing in 1951. Um, they didn't go off that rationing until the coronation of the Queen in 1953. Um, you know, they, they're they're still digging out the rubble in London and in in other places too. They're still rebuilding uh, Canterbury, uh, Coventry Cathedral, as I talked about in my sermon a few weeks ago. Um, you know, they, so they have a certain attitude. Um, I, I once watched a really interesting video on YouTube uh, of different adaptations of Little Women. And there's a big difference between the version that was done during the Depression, the one that was done in uh, post, post World War II, the one that was done, you know, affected by early 90s feminism. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's an interest. And, and that's, you know, we're thinking who, is, who, who, who made this and who was the audience? Anybody else got any thoughts? Oh, yes, Carl. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, grand. Uh, no regret. Uh, <laughs> no. This is one advantage or disadvantage of being an octogeranium like me is that I started out with the Christmas Carol from a book, uh, read bits and pieces of it and various school things, and then of course I read the whole thing and then I read it several other times. And then of course, I started to see the movie versions and so forth. Now, I can't answer for the rest of you boys and girls, but I think it is a bit of a shock to any young person, the first time they see a movie adaptation of a book that they have loved and they will get a real shock. Hey, that's not the book. That's not the book. Who is this fella? There was no girl there. You know, you know what I'm talking about. I absolutely know what you're talking about, Carl. Yes, it has happened to me many times. Yeah. So the point is, with growing maturity, your horizons expand as well as your waistline. So that's my <laughs> expectation. But to get back to what I was saying, essentially, from my point of view, the additions I love, unless they are really clumsily uh, thing. I loved, say, the first thing you showed, the churchyard scene. I didn't find that at all offensive or disturbing. Now, that whole business in the last one, the Alistair Sim one, but the uh, landlady or whoever she was on the stairs and in the bedroom and so on. That's not in the book for heaven's sake, but it's delightful. It's exactly what probably did happen if she did happen to come in then. So I'm not making any examples here, but when the storyline and particularly the essential character of things is distorted, then that's what gets me upset. Mm -hmm. So most of those that you, I mean, I did not mind that musical version of uh, them singing uh, on Scrooge's coffin, you know, Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead, or whatever the heck it was. Thank saying. you very much, yes. <laughs> well, you know, me. <laughs> anyhow, that's all I have to say there. That's one way of looking at it, and that's the way I do. And, and that's the thing, you know, I was saying it a little bit at, at the beginning that, you know, some people think a good ad adaptation is a faithful adaptation, but I have seen very wooden faithful adaptations of books that I have read. And on the other hand, I've seen ones in which they do add or tweak or, or find a different way of, because it's a different medium from print to, to film. 
Uh, and, and that's why I said too, you know, for some people it's, does this feel right? Does this feel like I felt when I was reading that story or that book? Do I still feel those same emotions? Um, I, I'll give a, I'll give an example of, you know, I, I read, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, uh, and then I went to see the films, which uh, have just had their their twentieth uh, anniversary of the of the first one of the trilogy being released, and they're they're really fantastic adaptation. But there is I, I don't know how many people have read The Lord of the Rings. Can I see a show of hands? Okay, a fair number. My favorite character in in The Lord of the Rings is Faramir. Um, it doesn't matter if you know who that is, but it's it's a, a, a character, a sort of secondary character um, for, for much of the story. And they they very much changed him in the films. And I'm very displeased about it. I don't mind the other things that they have changed or added, but it was it was the one thing that I, I couldn't stand because I cared so much about the character as he was written. Uh, and so, you know, you have those. Feel, I, and I remember um, when I went to see it on an opening night and uh and he he uttered a line which wasn't in the book and completely changed the plot and and i literally heard someone behind me mutter who had also obviously read the books uh mutter very quietly what the hell <laughs> 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 because, because this was not you know not in the story not right and i nearly laughed because it was exactly what i had been thinking myself and so you know there's there's a delicate balance right between tinkering with something um, and, and having something that is, is very true to it. Like um, the scene, I don't know, is she a char lady? Is she sort of a maid of all work, but the, the lady with, with Scrooge there in, in those scenes um, or, uh, or, you know, even, even the, the backstory that has been written, you know, this, this other employer or, or, you know, people dying in childbirth, they, they, and, and then that scene, that, that funeral of, of, of Marley's, which we are told about, but don't see in the story. You know, these, these are intelligent ways of, of conveying things uh, in, in, in film form, you know, and I, I think they work. I think they work. Kathy? Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, after I read the reread A Christmas Carol when we were doing the study, um, I think the last scene with the, uh, the woman that he gives the guinea to, um, I think it's a way of portraying uh, where he talks about himself, about he was wise enough to know that no, that uh, people were laughing at him, but he, 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 he wasn't insulted by that. He heeded them and said, well, some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset and knowing these would be blind anyway. And I thought, well, it sort of, it sort of portrays like his, his kookiness, his, his exuberance and, and, uh, people would think he had gone mad because of what he did. But I think that scene helps to portray this, but just on the screen. But I think it also really reflects um, our experience as Christians because a lot of people laugh at us too. Absolutely, absolutely, right? We're, uh, we're actually quite uh, countercultural. Yes. Which sounds kind of funny. We weren't always, of course. Uh, but certainly now we're, 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 the, you know, unusual, aren't yes. we? We, we people who, who, when we're allowed to show up to church every, every week and, and, you know, have these discussions and those kinds of things. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, there, there are a lot of people who think that Scrooge has lost it, right. Um, mm -hmm. from her, uh, in that, that adaptation, um, certainly in the original story, Bob is, is, you know, thinking, okay, I'm going to beat this guy over the head with a poker and then go call for the, the men in the white coats to come and take him away. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, um, and, but, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think he's crazy. I think he's just happy and never has been before. Yeah. He's you know? just exuberant, but I, I just thought it was an interesting way to portray that little wee bit about, he didn't really go crazy. He's just crazy with joy, I guess. That's right. Um, it's, it's, it's it, filmic. How right. it's, still yes. it's it's how it, it's uh, reflected and then i have one other question and it's about costumes it's about the clothing of the era oh, it, okay there are several times in the book where it mentions him wearing his comforter which is hanging down his white comforter okay what type of garment is that is that like a, a big sweater to insulate him i honestly i i'm pretty sure that we're talking about a blanket okay. like we, when we say comforter right 
Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the, these, okay, so these are the, this is Bob Cratchit for, for those mm. of you who haven't, and, and it talks about him taking it off when he gets in it home, right? Yes. Both, both um, when he's carrying Tiny Tim back from the service, when we first see them, um, and then, yeah, and then later. Um, and, and, you know, these are people who, who can't afford, um, can't afford, you know, a, a, a warm winter coat. And they're talking, sorry, Carl, I can still hear you. Do you mind just muting while we're? Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, you know, you, 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 these people don't have a down coat like we would, right? Uh, which is the equivalent. And, and I, I sometimes make a joke. I'm like, oh yeah, I wore my really warm down coat that day, the one that looks like a duvet with a hood. It's, uh -huh. it's the same principle. You might tie it around you or belt it around you and it, like he's wearing a blanket. So that's what it was. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious because I'd never heard that type of garment described before. No, and it's, yeah, technically not a garment. It's technically, oh. I, I'm wearing a blanket around, a like a shawl. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Sally. In fact, it was more like a quilt. Yeah. Well, it what, what you call a quilt and what you call a, a thing with down in it, right? Yeah. A blanket. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. A quil For me, a quilt is a thing with cotton batting and stitching in it right but other people call, i once saw an hilarious discussion online about what do you call that thing and people were like duvet i call it quilt i call it comforter i call it you know eider down there are different names for it but it's the thing we you know that the feathers are in that people use as a as a blanket i have one on my bed right now um and it's very common in in europe as well um and that's that's the thing i'm talking about when i was a child that was what i had on my bed, and I think originally it probably belonged to my grandmother. And mm -hmm. and uh, take your comforter, dear. <laughs> well, you know, you want to be warm and snuggly, right? Whether you're in bed or whether you're apparently wandering around the the streets of Dickensian in London. And it's nice and light on your feet. Well, that's the other thing, right? It's my wool is heavy. It's warm, but it's heavy. Um, mm -hmm. And and you know, they always talk about layering things and and how people used to layer things when they didn't have, you know, Gore-Tex or whatever. <laughs> um, and then of course you can't afford things. And the thing about that comforter is it would probably do double duty. It would be the thing you wore outside and it'd be the thing they put on the bed because for warmth. These people are really poor. They're not always uh, depicted as poor. It, there's a lovely um, passage in the original story about um, Mrs. Cratchit. We don't know her first name. The Muppets give her a name, Emily. And sometimes you see it in uh, names in, in other versions as well. Mrs. Cratchit, um, the way they describe her dress, it's it's an old dress. And this is something they do in the Muppets. Um, the Cratchits are, are wearing clothes that are, are about 10 years out of date because they can't afford the newest whatever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So she's wearing a dress that ha they call it, a, it's been t turned and then returned. And that's, it's a stitching technique because things are fraying, right? Um, and, and so her dress is old fashioned. It's probably at least 10 years, you know, about, or, or possibly even 15 years out of date, right? Whenever they last could afford to, to buy new clothes and it's been mended. Um, but the ribbons in her hair are new because they don't cost much and they look cheerful, mm -hmm. right? Which is actually a, a perfect metaphor for the Cratchits, right? They're very poor. Their child is dying, right? But, but they are cheerful all the same. Mm -hmm. Well. Carl just looked up comforter in the concise Oxford, just to be real, and it's what, a scarf? A woolen scarf. That's all the Oxford concise says. It, it, it can frankly, be that too, that's yeah. what I thought it was. But, yeah. I, but I also, I think it can be either, and, and usually you see the scarf in, in um, film versions, right? Because, because it would look really stupid to be wearing a, a blanket because it, it would be that you know six or eight feet long and go round and round and yeah, i mean you know there. it's it, it is it is what we would probably call a blanket or a blanket scarf now as well but but you know that that kind of thing so it, it could it could be the woolen part of it but but it also is is entirely possible that it is this blanket with down well, in it i was going to say if we do have a a actual in-person service in the winter really bad day, you'll see Carl with his uh, enormous scarf, and then you'll you'll know what sort of scarf we're talking about. <laughs> like, like, like the fourth doctor in, in Doctor Who, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I don't know if they even use the term scarf to any extent at the time, at the, the time of Scrooge. I no, you wouldn't. I haven't come across it too often, I don't think. No, not very often, no. Um, 
what are people wearing? It, 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 and it depends, right? Like you're kind of getting at a point too where, where we're coming out of cloaks and into coats. Um, you still do see them. Um, it, it depends on the people. Uh, a really clever adaptation will have um, what what was really because you know the year doesn't change and everybody you know starts putting on um, you know the fashions of that year, right? People wear things you know because they like them because they can't afford the newest version, whatever it is. It's it's you know three years ago. It's it's you know last year's. I showed you that picture of the girl with the book. You know that's that's a, that's an eighteen forty seven ish image it's not quite you you know it's not 1843 um because of the shape of the bodice of her dress and the way her hair is um if if you know costumes which i do because i'm a nerd um and and i and i like this kind of thing history of fashion is very interesting and this was this was a period where we're moving out of the high waists that was the 1830s um so in some christmas carol adaptations you'll see those high waists um and and lots of sort of ringlets around the face and high hair for women, and then you're moving into and you know parted smooth hair and wider wider skirts until we get into those hoop skirts you know like in Gone with the Wind, that's the 1860s right? But the 1850s we're moving into that also. That but I digress. <laughs> Christmas Carol. Any other thoughts or questions or observations? You you were there talking about you know about how the Cratchit family didn't have much money right mm -hmm. and it made me think of the George C. Scott episode uh, mm -hmm. part in the movie there I don't know I can't think of the gentleman's name that plays the ghost of Christmas present um, in George C. Scott I can't think of his name but uh, it, the part of the movie there where okay. yeah the part of the movie there where Bob Cratchit was petting the goose right mm -hmm. and, and of course, Scrooge goes as an awfully small goose, and, and then all of a sudden the the ghost of present goes right into his face and says, "It's all that Bob Cratchit can afford." That part yeah. makes me laugh every time. Yeah, every part makes and, me laugh. Yeah, a goose is cheaper than a turkey at this time. Is, yeah, yeah. Um, and and then and their goose is is probably yes, quite small. It's not you know this is not a pretty picturesque feast. This is what they oh. can afford. Right. right. Um, and so that's 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 the the, the enormous generosity um, that screwed. You, you remember that at the end, he he buys that huge turkey, the one that's as big as the boy that he talks to, the one as big as me, that one. Yes. Um, and sends it to the Cratchits secretly. They don't know who who sent it. Right. Yeah. It's an anonymous. Yeah. And it's, in that one, they, they don't know. But I that's think right. They don't. Yeah. And they don't. They don't in the story either. He doesn't go. Um, this is something that is often gotten added to that. He doesn't um, go to their house that day. He waits until the following day when when uh, Bob comes into work um, to, to yeah. show him how he has changed. Um, but but a lot of films have him show up at the house because that is, again, a film, a filmic shorthand for mm -hmm. for what's going on instead of, you know, uh, it makes sense narratively. Um, I, I get it. Uh, he just he you know in in societal terms he wouldn't have just showed up at their house. And I don't know if any of you would want your boss to show up at your house, <laughs> just you know unannounced on Christmas morning. I I don't think I would. Um, but but that's you know a turkey that big and a turkey too. Turkeys are not native to England. Uh, they have them there now, but but they're they're you know American. They're North American. Um, creatures, yeah. right? Um, and and this is uh, the beginning of when people were sort of s switching over to having turkey rather than than goose or or what have you on on yeah. the day. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's the difference between the 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 feast that that Scrooge sees and and the one that he then ends up giving them. Uh, yeah, the, thing right, kind yeah. of, the, the thing that's interesting too, you know, people sit down and work out what Bob Cratchit's salary is. Um, which was 10 shillings a week, um, which I thought, it was 15. I thought it was 15. I think it's 10. Oh, okay. um, in any case, someone did the equivalent of, of whatever the current, you know, what it would be in, in American modern um, whatever. And, and they, and they worked it down to what it would be per year and they worked it down to what it would be for, per hour. And I honestly can tell you that it's more than the current minimum wage in the U S. So, you know, this emblem of, of, you know, poverty, and, and I grant you, he has children to support and one of them sick. And this is before the, the National Health Service was established in England. It's a hundred years before. Um, but, but isn't that interesting? 
that in in modern times your your minimum wage in the states is less than the equivalent of Bob Cratchit's in 1843 in A Christmas Carol. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. Well, so remember that conversation. Mm-hmm. That, that's kind of, that's kind of interesting now when you hear when you hear it that way and stuff like that. But the part of the Alistair Sim one at the end that you showed where he was so happy and jolly, mm -hmm. that part with his um, I'm going to say his maid. I'm going to say she's sure. the maid. Okay. And, you know, she's wearing that bib thing, that bib, that yep. part was, her apron. To try, yeah, the apron, when that part was, she goes to try to, where, where he goes to try to stand on his head and she ah, goes, right she throws it over thing. her head. That part, both my mother and I, every time we watch that part, we're cracking up laughing every year. <laughs> that part makes us laugh. Well, I was, you told me that before, and that's, that was uh, why I put that clip in, especially, you know, I know the sound is oh, yeah. a little bit off, but, but it's, uh. <laughs> It, it's so funny to to watch it, and and, uh, and you know if you're trying to if you're trying to watch that show and you can't find it on TV, it's on YouTube for free to watch. It's in the public domain, as as they say. Yeah. And and well, so right now, uh, Crave, right now, anybody that's got Crave right now, Crave TV, they actually have the Alistair Sim one on right now. That on too, but but you can watch it for free without without paying a subscription on YouTube as well. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Hmm. Any other no, thoughts no. or? Hmm. Do you know that there's one thing I've been thinking of? Well, actually, there's two things. One is watching Judy who has a halo over her head. And I think that's that's very nice touch, well, Judy. Yeah, whatever it is behind your head is, <laughs> is round and looks vaguely, yes, saintly. The, the other thing, actually, is the theme of, of which doesn't really get mentioned, of hope. And, and I think, I mean, we come with our hope and we hope uh, Scrooge is hopeless at the beginning. He has no hope, no dream, no nothing of, of anything more than making more money. But I think, you know, in this age where sometimes our, our faith is tested, we still have that hope in the midst of all the pandemic and the stuff that's happening around the world and, and environmental issues and all the rest of that. There is this hope for redemption and miraculously in this and it is miraculous it happens mm -hmm. and i and think that is part of what touches us is is seeing this this redemption and and end of hope or and, and at least I, I mean fulfillment of hope and i i think the thing too about the story it's it's not just that he's hopeless he doesn't even know he is yeah. so closed off right he he's so Close the solitary is an oyster, right? Which which is also it's not just you know, it's it's hard, it's shelly, and it's closed. You can't get into it, right? You know, if you ever try to break into an oyster, it's it's a it's quite the effort, and you might slice your hand open in the in the process, right? He he doesn't even know. He is so lacking in self awareness as well as awareness of other people that he doesn't even realize what he's missing. And you see that, the beginnings of that, when in the scene in the story, um, which is in, also in several versions of it, um, the, the Muppet Christmas Carol is a particularly effective um, one, of, of Belle pointing this out to him, that, that he has, is ceasing to have an awareness of these things because he has made this goal um, to, to be whatever it is, to, to be financially solvent, to be rich, to, to have money. Like, what is it? We don't even know. He doesn't even know what it is, but he has this vague idea that he has to just truck forward like a, a locomotive that can't stop. Right. Um, and, and that's, it's, it's a, it's a deliberate act on his part. And then it becomes uh, an automatic instinctive act. He's not even perpetuating it anymore. It just is. And, and it takes that um, experience that he has to, to shock him out of it and to, to teach him, right, to make him aware. Um, and, and he is sufficiently able to, to open himself up to that. It's all well and good to, to be taught something, but if you're not listening to it, it falls on deaf ears. Doesn't it make and, you wonder what will jar us out of our... Well, it's true, and it's something that Christ, it's something Christ says to us in the Gospels, right? With anyone with ears, listen, right? And my dad used to say there there's a difference between listening and hearing, as well. You know, are you letting it penetrate? Are you considering? 
um, what what you have heard and and how it it affects you. Hmm? Judy, asking, you were asking about my halo. Yes, the cat tree. Ah, oh. <laughs> and I'm sitting in a rocking chair, which is why the cat tree keeps moving. That's right. It's not. It's not moving so much. You are, but uh, but no. It's a. It's a nice effect. I, I wish I had a halo. I mean, I've got, I've got some art behind me in the windows. I'm I'm here in the boardroom in the in the church downstairs. But uh, but it's not quite as impressive as the halo. I, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> any other any other thoughts or or? Uh... I know you're unmuted. Hello? Carl. Yes. I was going to say. Speaking of you, it's better to be deserving a halo than to have one. Sure, sure, that makes sense. You know, do you know what I always think of? I, I think of the story, The Littlest Angel. I don't know if any of you have heard that one. It's a it's a wonderful story. And he's a very young boy who has has died and has gone to heaven. And the problem is that his halo keeps slipping off his head and rolling down the, the streets of heaven. Uh, it'll it'll slip off the back of his head and and you know be away before he even has a chance to to grab a hold of it or it'll slip down over one eye or the other eye and he just he can't keep the thing straight. Bless him. It's a charming little uh, little version of it. I, I think Judy, yours seems to be pretty solid. <laughs> <laughs> Not going anywhere. Well, we're coming we're coming to the end of our time. If if. Uh, if anybody else has anything they want to add. Doesn't look like it. Just want but, to say Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. And and I'm I'm you know, I won't lie, Father Father Stephen and I were pretty blue about having to to make that announcement on Sunday. Uh, and I, I, I dearly wish that we could celebrate Christmas in person, but we will we will give you the very best service we can online uh, and continue to do so for however long that this lasts. Um, and please feel free to join us at, at any point. And, and of course, uh, you can always reach either of us or, or any of the honoraries uh, by, by phone or, or email if, if you need to chat. Uh, we're always up for that. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question I want to ask. I want to ask, um, Carl and Elizabeth, are you going to be there on Boxing Day? Do you think, or? or yes, we are. Yes. You are. Okay, that's that's well, both of us. wife is going to be me, and there's going to be Howie and Diane, and there's going to be Colin, and oh, it's going to be a crowd. That's <laughs> it, it, it's it's going to be fantastic, and and uh, yes, Archdeacon Sally is is uh, wonderfully uh, doing our our Sunday the twenty sixth service Boxing Day as we tend to know it, but also the Feast of Stephen as as we say in in Good King Wenceslas. Um, so you actually get to have it on on the actual day, uh, Saint Stephen's Day, um, and that gives uh, Father Stephen and I a little bit of a break, and then we'll come back all bright eyed and bushy tailed for the second of January. <laughs> all right. You have four singers for Boxing Day as well. Myra's playing, and there'll be four singers. That's oh, right. Super. You got. You got. We, we're. We're. You're all set up, Sally. <laughs> oh my goodness! They're going to be a joyful crowd. We're not. We're not letting. Enjoy. Yeah. We're not letting this uh, slide. We're going to give you the best services we possibly can. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, I'm just say God bless us. Everybody. It is. I, well, I, I want to thank all of you for for attending our Advent study in person or by Zoom or anybody who's who's watching this as a as a recording. Um, I want to thank uh, my co-presenter Archdeacon Sally for for all of your insights today and uh, in the previous weeks. And I want to thank Colin McKenzie, our technical wizard extraordinaire, who made sure that the Zoom link worked and the PowerPoint played and the clips were mostly working. Uh, I think you got the, the gist um, for our presentations. Um, and I want to close with a quote from writer and apologist uh, G.K. Chesterton from his 1906 book, Charles Dickens. The beauty and the real blessing of the story do not lie in the mechanical plot of it, the repentance of Scrooge, probable or improbable, they lie in the great furnace of real happiness that glows through Scrooge and everything around him, that great furnace, the heart of Dickens. Whether the Christmas visions would or would not convert Scrooge, they convert us. Mm. Thank you, and everybody say it. God bless us. 
everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and God bless.